The KRGS Doors Show, proudly brought to you by KRGS Doors. For all your shopfront roller shutters, roller grills, folding closures and bifold doors, visit www.krgsdoors.com.au. Welcome to the KRGS Doors podcast. I'm your host, Drew Blackman. The aim of our podcast is to talk to cool people with cool stories, whether it be our suppliers, customers, staff, other business owners or people from different walks of life and get to know them a bit better. If you're interested in coming on, drop us a line or email or connect with us via Facebook and we can have a chat to see what we can do. On today's podcast, I'm joined by KRGS Doors Managing Director Clayton Blackman and we chat to Ross Strudwick, CEO of Struddies. Ross began retailing with the first Struddy sports store opening at Sunnybank Plaza way back in 1975. In the early 70s, Ross, while playing rugby league for St George in Sydney, was recruited by Senator Ron McAuliffe, the president of the Queensland Rugby League. Ross joined the Valleys Club in 1972 and went on to represent Brisbane, Queensland and Australia during his career. To ensure that Ross stayed in a Maroons jersey, the QRL set Ross up in his first retail outlet. From this initial outlet, the Strutty's brand has grown from retail to encompass importing, wholesale and manufacturing. Please welcome to the podcast, Mr Ross Strudwick. Ross, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. What is the Ross Studrick story? Well, <laughs> I'm not too sure where I could start and finish. Um, I've had a pretty uh, pretty fast-moving type of life. Um, I've sort of uh, put everything into everything I've ever done and probably upset a few people on the way and probably found a lot of good friends also on the way. I've always had a, uh, a sort of... A personality that uh, just wanted to win, and uh, it didn't matter whether I was playing social or whether I was playing in a competition, or whether I was at work or whether I was at home. Uh, I think uh, winning or being the best was probably my focus. Never ever looked back at the past to see what achievements I had achieved. Um, it was always about the next challenge, and uh, that was business, family life, friendships, sport. I say, I think we can relate to that. It sounds very familiar. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know when uh, when I uh, got a contract over in England with uh, Halifax, um, the uh, the guy who owned the club, uh, Dave, he uh, he said to me one day, he says, "You know, Strutty, Queensland." He said, "I've been all over Queensland and asked about you." He said, "Half of Queensland absolutely hate you." <laughs> he said, "The other half absolutely love you." <laughs> and that's that's what happens when you when you uh, sort of looking ahead all the time. You do uh, you do make some enemies, but you make a lot of good friends. So you started out in the sports retail business. How did that come along? And then how did you get into yeah. manufacturing sportswear? You know, at, at the beginning, I, I said uh, the uh, sport and uh, business actually intertwined with everything that I've done over the years, in, and and uh, so. To get into the business to start with, I uh, I was playing for Valleys. Uh, I was under contract to the Queensland Rugby League and the Valleys. And uh, I played for Australia in 75. I was going to go back to St George where I started my career. I, I saw I went and saw uh, Ron McAuliffe and the uh, people who ran Valleys and said, you know, thinking about going back to uh, secure a future back in Sydney. And they said, well, well, you know, what can we do to keep you here? And at that stage, I was a sales rep for Sharp Corporation. And uh, so I was sort of into this selling. Um, I was originally a, uh, I'd done an apprenticeship as a fitter and turner and then finished as a marine engineer. And um, so sales was sort of new to me, but it wasn't new because I used to love talking a hell of a lot. <laughs> that and, was Sharp, um, the electronics uh, business, mate, was it? Yes. TVs yes. and microwaves and all that type of thing? That's it. Microwaves were just coming in. It was a new product in that when I started there. So you, you, pick, you pick the good product there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I said, I wouldn't mind uh, having a sports store. Wouldn't mind starting my own sports store. So they said, right, let's look into it. This is Ron McAuliffe who was going to help you out. Yep. Wow. Ron McAuliffe, he was a sen- Senator Ron. Yeah, yep. yeah, Senator Ron, yeah. And what, uh, where, was the, where was your shop based at? The first one was uh, probably the first um, regional shopping centre in Brisbane um, at Sunny Beach. Sunnybank Plaza? Sunnybank Plaza, yeah. So I got started up there and from there, it went from there till now. So you 
started out as a sports company uh, similar to, I'd say, like a Rebel Sports selling shoes and football boots and things like that. Hang and on then, a minute. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. You mean Rebel was like us? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, correct me. Is, yes. that, is that what you said? That that is <laughs> that is correct. Rebel followed the footsteps of Strutties. Yes, that is correct. Um, well, let, let me tell you. Remember Amart, Amart Sports. I was on the piss with the uh, <laughs> with the who who was an owners at that stage of, of uh, Amart, but. Um, yeah, it was after a football match or whatever, and they they was asked me questions about strutties and the sports trade and that sort of stuff. Now they owned Amart Furniture at the time. Anyway, anyway next thing I know, they've opened up on bloody uh, the road that uh, runs up the Garden City from Sunnybank, and opened up a bloody uh, an Amart All Sports <laughs> on the back of the info that I gave them. Anyway, they couldn't get a, a Nike account or an Adidas account. So I was actually su- supplying them Nike and Adidas for the first year or so of their um, of their operations. I wow! To know that they finished up bloody a multinational company, company and sold out to Rebel and so forth. And and didn't offer you a Zach, mate? No, oh, I didn't knock us around because um, I was you know I was playing pretty high profile football then, and you know kids used to come and buy their footy boots off us and their shorts and um, just just about anything. It, it was yeah, you know, it wasn't a problem. Opposition, opposition's never really been a problem to me all the way through, because I don't, I don't focus on them. I focus on 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 strutties, and uh, yeah, we just uh, make sure that we're internal. Most of the opposition we have at, in, today, I wouldn't even know who owned them. I know what they do, but yeah. I wouldn't know the personnel behind them because I don't think that's important. How many staff do you have working for strutties at the moment? We've got uh, forty-seven full time and uh, six casuals, which is yeah, a little bit different. Back to where we were at uh, at Sunnybank. Uh, at Sunnybank, yeah. And where's your where's so your you where's your, your, your branch at? Uh, um, where's your branch base at now, Ross? Uh, we're at uh, Bright's Road at, at Logan Home. We're in an eight hundred square metre warehouse and uh, manufacturing plant, uh, as well as a retail outlet. So from seventy five to now, we uh, we probably had four different directions with, that we went in. Um, you know, back in '75, we were uh, strictly retail. Uh, we owned, I owned my own store. Um, within the next three year, four years, we'd opened uh, two more, two more stores. We had one in Ipswich, and one in towards the Gold Coast, Logan Homes. We'll, we'll call it Logan Home because it's just down the road. And then I actually went over to England, coached for five years. So I got back in '91. But while I was over in England, and my brother was running the um, the stores and everything was fine. Uh, but while I was over there, I saw the uh, way the sports stores over there were run and they were all franchises, you know, yeah. HB Sport and so forth. And I thought, well, geez, why can't we do this back in Queensland? So when I got back, I had a mate who had worked at a school and um, between him and I, we we wrote our own buddy franchise agreement and uh, started looking for franchises. And so uh, uh, over the uh, next uh, four to five years, uh, we opened up 26 stores. Jesus. Wow. In northern New South Wales and Queensland, all over Queensland. The franchising, to me, was hard work because uh, <clears throat> franchisees, they uh, they tend to uh, treat, well, I, I thought they were babies, but they thought that we should be giving them everything. So mm-hmm. there's always a conflict. And I, I've always thought to myself, you know, franchising really can't work unless you've got a really good franchise agreement in place, which uh, people like McDonald's and so forth, yeah, uh, they have. But I, I know in my time, franchising has really diminished virtually down to nothing again. In those franchisees, Ross, they've got to have the same passion as what you do, mate. They do. And some of them did, but not all of them. The successful ones did. did the ones yeah. that wanted me to hand feed them, that went out of business. Just mentioned then you coached over in England, mate. Who, who'd you coach over there? What, what club? Halifax. Halifax and then um, London Broncos. But we were London Crusaders when I was there. Yeah, before the before they changed to the London Broncos. Yeah. So yeah. did you, in yeah. that Halifax side, I think it's one stage, Graham Eady, Chris Anderson played with Halifax. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Chris Anderson was their coach. He uh, he took him to two Wembleys, actually. So were you? He he was with. Uh, he was at Halifax after you. No, before me. Oh, before In you, fact, yeah. I was at Wembley for the uh, for his for his second uh, appearance there, 
Uh, Graham Eady uh, was fullback. Yeah, there was a uh, c- couple of other Sydney guys in the side. Uh, the Brisbane, uh, Brisbane and Sydney guys in the side was sort of half full of them. Yeah, well, I took over from him, and I uh, I had the distinction of taking him from uh, Wembley to second division. Okay. So you went down. <laughs> so the... I wasn't very popular. Wasn't either. popular, <laughs> mate, when you went backwards. What about the London Broncos? Because I know, obviously, a, a rugby league follower. The rugby league in England's more of the northern, up the northern uh, side of England, uh, England, where it's Wigan and St Helens and Manchester and all that sort of area. Where having a, a London Broncos side must have been hard to tr- hard to try and convert the locals, because obviously the EPL so so big in London. I don't believe that um, rugby league will uh, ever be successful in London. Uh, to the extent that they needed to be, uh, you'd have to you'd have to spend too much money. Uh, I know the um, the year that uh, well, the, the last year that Halifax went there, they had um, uh, Elry Henley playing for them. Um, Sean, uh, whatever his name is, was a halfback for, for Sean, Edwards. Sean, Edwards. Oh, Sean Edwards. Yeah, Sean Edwards. They all played in that side. Yeah, it was um, almost a northern side playing playing for. Um, um, London Crusaders, and, and, yeah, and and but you can't keep them there. No, and it's too it's, and it's too bloody expensive. And even to bring the um, Australian guys over there, like they used to come home and, and uh, you know actually get on there and plead for players to come over and pay, and we, we were paying them more money than we could afford. And, and you can't get sponsorships like you can up north uh, because the crowds are probably um, if if you've got. 500 to a, um, a shitty game, you'd be great. And, uh, you, you know, if we, if we played a Wigan or one of the first division sides, um, you'd probably get 2,000. And it just, it's just not enough. So no. we, we had Bundaberg Rum as a sponsor for a couple of years. Um, so an Aussie brand. Uh, we had a, yeah, that was good. We used to have, have to take a free bottle of, um, Bundy up and give to the, uh, the, 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 the club we played for up there to try to get the, um, the Poms to drink Bundy Rum. But, <laughs> <laughs> if, if my players didn't drink it, the Aussies in the other side drank it straight up. <laughs> Probably drank it to keep warm, mate, so, over there. Well, it's the only way to keep warm. So it should have t- taken off, actually. Yeah, exactly. yeah it should have really taken off. Mate, yeah. just, just back on to the Struddy sports side of things. You've been yep. in business since 1975, as you mentioned. What do you put your success yep. down to? I think... Um, Probably hard work, but honesty, not vers- uh, not versifying too far. So, you know, staying staying to core ranges, li- living to uh, financially to the income. So if there's no bloody uh, money coming in, you can't spend it. And if it does come in, you, uh, most of it belongs to uh, suppliers or other people that you that you need. And I, you know, over the years, the amount of people I've seen go into business and they go in un- unprepared, which so did I, but I made a lot of mistakes, but I was clever enough to get out of those mistakes. But most people don't get out of it because they they, they take $2,000 on a Saturday. They believe they can spend $2,000, but yeah. the $2,000 is not theirs. No. It's probably $50 yeah. is theirs. And, and so that's uh, – I, I think that's a big reason why we've stayed, um, stayed afloat over the years. But, like, in the 90s, um, there was a depression on. And uh, I'd only just come back from England. I'd come back with a pocket full of money. And um, every, every every year, even when I was playing for uh, Queensland or coaching, coaching uh, brothers and that, um, I used to always put the money into the uh, sports stores or into houses. You know? So at, at one, at, in the 90s, I had seven houses. And um, when, uh, when that crash really came, and, uh, the banks actually foreclosed on a lot of people on... Um, on, on borrowings because the yes. capital wasn't there to cover the, cover yes. the cost. But we had to sell the, um, the whole seven of those houses, uh, including our own home. And, uh, you know, I was renting. It, it started renting in the 90s. Uh, but my whole thing was we've got to keep this business afloat because it's going to come good again. And if it yeah. comes good again and we're prepared for it, it's going to be better. And that's exactly what happened. Um, we come out of that. Um, next thing we bought, we bought a house. Our business is flowing again. Change banks. They loved us because there was the potential there and so yeah, forth. the growth. And then the buddy uh, GFC come along in, in 2000. But we were ready for it then. We did 
we didn't have the exposure to other houses and so forth. So we, we had the business, and the, and the business we were running quite lean, and uh, and we got leaner because of the of the GFC and because of the nineties. We knew what we had to do to uh, stay afloat, and virtually what it all boils down to, which is exactly the same as what it is now with the uh, virus that's getting around, is uh, you've got to be prepared to go back and. Uh, do the work yourself, sweep the floors, buddy, uh, make sure that buddy, everyone's happy and you got to put people off, and that, which is a, a tough thing. But you've got to, look, we, we've done a, as soon as we knew that this virus thing was coming, um, we uh, straight away changed our uh, forecasts, yeah. um, give it to the bank, said this is, this is what we reckon it's going to be. And, and, and in April... Um, we were down a third of our turnover, a third of our profit, but we still had the same staff. But it didn't take us long, like when we'd done the forecast that we had to put staff off, um, which we did. Um, others went off on uh, sick leave. Others went off on long service. Uh, when the job keeper come in, um, some come in to work, but we said, well, we don't need you in here. We'll pay you the job keeper, but you don't come to work because you'll just, uh, you know, you've got too many people doing nothing. You finish up with nothing. Yeah. One thing my dad used to say, if you've got one boy working for you, you've got a good you've got a good work. You get two boys, you've got a half a kid. You get three boys, you might as well shut the shop. Yeah. And uh that's that's probably the attitude that I've taken all the way through it. Yeah, you know, with the boys, with, with every, if we got most of them back at work now and they're all pretty happy, but they work ship work. Uh when I say ship work, one will work Tuesday, Wednesday, one will work um Thursday, Friday and so on. Because of schools, um you know, we do a lot of school business and we do a lot of uh, rugby league. You know, they were, that, that's our main um, points of, 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 uh, yes. of our sales at the present is schools and that, which which has also changed <laughs> from back in the uh, back in seventy five. It's amazing how it all shifts around and different focuses. Focuses, and I think that's probably one of the things of our success too is that we just didn't stay in retail. Uh, we actually don't do any retail at all now. You got to be a bit diverse in these times. Yes, you, I, I think you got to you, you got to follow what it, what what's the future. Correct. You know, like like I, don't, I can remember my brother bought a uh, a cash register with that plugged into the wall. You know, and I said, "What do we want a cash register for?" Because we used to have a tenant and put our money in. <laughs> <laughs> and that's sort of, and I, I, I thought that was a waste of money. And that at this stage we're at Sunnybank Hills. Uh, in a new shopping centre there, and uh, I thought, Jesus, and, 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 but he was always thinking of the future in creation. I'm concentrating on sales. He's concentrating on infrastructure, which now uh, I realise I learnt from him very, uh, you know, a lot of bloody good stuff there because now our infrastructure is always about a year or two years ahead of what we need it. We'll always be able to do anything. And it's amazing with this um, virus, we found there was no aeroplanes coming out of China, that uh, we had to start making Australia made. Well, we had already had that in place. You know, we've got our own submachines, we've got our own presses, uh, printers, bloody embroidery machines. We've got the lot there. And so we got on social media and really hit the Australia made stuff. So if you need it now, we can do it. If you need stuff overseas, it's going to be 10 weeks now. Um, so our Australia made stuff uh, during <coughs> April till now as we've been uh, running 24-hour shifts. Wow, that's which good. Which is incredible. Yeah. So, you know, there's, if you're prepared to do it, there's, um, there's work for everyone all the time, I believe, but you've got to be prepared to do it. There's work there, mate. you just got to go and find it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You've got to go and, and you've got to go and find what that work is. <laughs> On, like I, I do a bit of fishing, so uh, we, we, we made fishing shirts. You know, the, the, the confraternity shield and the uh, – and the quiz and netball carnival is not on this year. You know, they had to get cancelled. So we, uh, on, on social media, just because the virus is here, don't let it beat you. Still get your merchandise, you know. And so we, we, we're still selling it now on, on social media. It's unbelievable. You, know? you, so, you, um, do do, you guys do do a lot of social media stuff. You're very, uh, very frequent with that, and obviously across all sports, whether it's rugby league or netball or or the schools, but you yep. do you do guys do do a tremendous job on uh, social media that uh, obviously we follow. It's amazing. Like we've gone from that bloody plug in the cash register <laughs> to now 
um, I'm talking to you on a bloody phone that uh, yeah, and which has been streamed all over the world. And uh, I've, I've I've been very uh, conscious since that plugging bloody machine that I have to be in 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 front of everything. One of the things. Ten years ago, I said, "Right, we've got to get on social media. We've got to start doing this. You know, our marketing's got to change." But I, I've never learned how to do it. <laughs> but started hiring the people that did. We've probably got the the best websites. We can build our own websites for, um, you know, our major customers. You know, they they want to sell stuff. They want to purchase from it. Uh, the, the stuff that our um, our staff can do these days it just blows me. Yeah, out it's there. a way, of- and that's probably why I'm. Talking, that's why I'm talking to you from Pottsville. Mate, they're trying to get rid of me now because they reckon I slow them up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are a bit old school, mate. Is that right? You're still stone and chisel? Mate, I... I, I there. That's what I <laughs> Pen and paper. Yeah, mate, look at this. Well, Same. Right, that's, Pen that's, and paper. They're the, notes for this, that's, they're the notes for this meeting. Look at the preparation <laughs> you've gone to, mate. Unbelievable. Well done. That's probably the most, yeah. most preparation we've had from someone to come on our podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, as I say, I'm, I'm probably uh, semi-retired now, or probably a bit more than that, because every time I go up there, they give me less and less to do. They're getting too smart for me. But they're they're trying to tell you something, Ross, my... are they? <laughs> well, Gary, uh, Gary's it, what I call in the in our old elder side of our business. We've oh, don't him, tell him that. He, he, won't, he, like he that. won't like you he saying like he's that. in the elder part of the store side of things, mate. Well, you know, you know, you know how he's got the bloody. Um, a hip replacement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mate, I've got a crook shoulder, and I told him we'll have a race when he gets out of hospital and see who recovers the quickest. Yeah, he's, he's a bit I soft. Reckon I, got, I reckon I'll knock him. I reckon you got him covered, mate. Yeah, but the rest of our staff, apart from a few that's been with me right from uh, the word go, we've got a couple of people there, probably five five of that staff have probably been with me for over 20 years. Yeah, that's good, mate. It's, um, it's a good sign of a business there that you, you've got guys there on long term. It's that's a good sign. They're not actually running the company. <laughs> really? Um, they're, they're the culture boys. That, that that the culture. We've got a we've got a great culture at um, at Stratis, which is the same culture that I had putting into uh, into my coaching. R- Rugby league actually taught me how to run a um, business. A, a, a business, yeah. It's a, it's the same. Same principles all the way through. A lot of people that same come principles. onto our podcast, Ross, say the same thing. You know, and they've got a, a crossover between business and sport, and they take a lot of things into their business that they use in sport, and they take a lot of things into their sport that they use in business. So it's a it's a fair crossover yeah. what you say. One of the things that I probably <clears throat> well, I don't regret it. I don't regret anything in my life because I've just had the the, the most fullest life that anyone could ever make a wish for. Um, but uh, one of the things I would do probably a little bit different um, was that uh, I put so much energy into rugby league um, that I neglected the business. Yeah. I used my name to, to get people to come in and buy stuff, but I didn't really do the work. You know, I didn't get major major accounts or like that because I was too busy, too busy bloody coaching, mate, and, and uh, I loved it. But when I stopped coaching um, – probably 92, 93, um, I started, you know, just full-on work and forgot about rugby league. And, uh, you know, since that day, you know, we've um, we've expanded. Grown so and grown and grown in the business. And, and making money. And making that's good. Money. You know, that, that's the bloody difference. You know, while I, while I was um, coaching, uh, the business, you know, we, and the period where we had all the franchises and um, importing for those guys and that sort of stuff, I, I still, if, if I had been there um, doing what I was doing at rugby league, and that is putting my whole energy into it, I believe we probably would have been bigger than Amart, uh, and we probably would have um, still been doing that retail franchise inside of it. Um, but I, no, I, I, I had to do rugby league. I had to do sport. Those uh, yeah. long-term employees obviously say a lot about yourself as well, wanting to be there and wanting to work for you for that period of time. What would you say your biggest challenges yeah. you face in business? Biggest challenges, I reckon, is uh, staffing. The reason, reason being, is that the uh, that the bigger you get, the more staff you got to have. When you when you get staffing in, I think the biggest the biggest mistake most companies do, and I'm I'm guilty of it, is that you don't train them right. You expect them to come in 
grab your culture and pick and, up and a go run with it. With it. And, uh, and, yeah, and I, and I believe our culture is probably the, the number one main reason that we are still in business and still going so bloody well is the way we do things and uh, that we, you know, we do it in a uh, in a sporting happiness. You know, it's, if you if you if you get a if you get a contract or you or you get a nice order, everyone's happy. It's like a little celebration, encouragement behind it, and the importance of getting that means something. With, without that without that training, and you just leave them to do their own job, they've still got that. That well, they don't know what a culture is, and so if they don't feel like working, they they probably lie to you and say, "Yep, yeah, I've done four calls today," but really, they might have been out playing golf or playing the pokey somewhere, you know. Yes. Um, so, so I think I think culture is probably the most important thing with staffing. Uh, right. So that that's on on that side of it. The other the other problems we have is the fly by night companies, like you. Um, <coughs> they they come in and. Uh, they bastardise all the um, product. They bastardise pricing. Uh, they promise high rebates, and within three years they're out of the business. Three or four years they're out of the business. But then, you, then you've still got the people like ISC who have probably twelve of the um, uh, NRL sides yes. at the present. Um, you've got uh, Canterbury who, you know, are still around but used to own twelve of those. Uh, BLK. Yeah, probably still around a little bit. They used to own twelve of those clubs. You know, it, it, it's these people. They, they 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 actually come in and they buy everything. They, they finish up going bankrupt or whatever, but they change companies. But they, the name stays there. Someone else comes in and and buys the buys the uh, the name. It buys the name. So therefore, you've got you've got ISC change ownership probably four times in the last ten years. Canterbury has uh, changed twice. Uh, BLK. Probably four times, and so you're up against this sort of stuff all the time. Um, and what they don't understand, most of these guys, because the owners are out of uh, Europe. You know, you just take England population, probably fits the, the cut size of the country fits into Victoria. So there's a lot of money in it. They come out here, and they, you know, the, the Broncos would probably get a mill from uh, ISC, and to get that back, to uh, get all the junior leagues and uh, all the all the all the bloody uh, stock shops and all that sort of stuff to buy the gear. Yes, but our population, what is it in Brisbane? You have got other sports and you have got other people out there against them. So therefore, they struggle. And when they struggle, that's when they bastardise everything. And and so that, that's always a problem. Um, we get around that. The you know we don't worry about NRL sides um, to a degree. We'd like to have a state league side, but it, it's not important to us. What's important to Strutties is our uh, the under sevens and the under eights, the grassroots, and the under nines. So we we go, we go from there up that way. So where where these guys might get an order for you know five hundred jerseys or something like that for um, Amart Sports, or whatever, we get an order for twenty shirts for an under seven side, and we're prepared to do that. We do that all over New South Wales, Queensland. Uh, West Australia, we, we go from the bottom up, and and that's that's also a, a strategy of ours that keeps us alive. If you could speak to your younger self, just starting out now, what advice would you give? I'd, I'd say the first thing that um, I would put to them is the uh, culture. Learn the culture. Learn the culture of who you're working for. Listen, listen to um, senior people, even though you mightn't agree with them. You, and uh, you still listen. You can take something. You doesn't mean to say you've got to do it. Just just listen to that. And, and but the culture is the main thing. To be honest. To be honest. To be honest with yourself, and be honest with your customers, and be honest with your employee. Always be honest. Now, in being honest, you might be able to tell a fib, but it's got to be an honest fib. <laughs> you know I, mean. I might I might use that one. An honest fib. Yes, you got to have an honest fib. If you've got an honest fib, you've no, normally got a fairly good sales rep. Yeah. <laughs> but you wouldn't want your IT guy or, your, or your, your graphics people to give you an honest fib. You just don't want a fib from them. But um, if, if a young bloke come in on sales, that's exactly what I'd be saying to him. Always be on time for appointments. Know your product. Know your client's needs. And, and always, always be available. That, 
our, our um, reps, and we've got 12 of them now, their phones are on 24 hours a day. Yes, has to and be. that's one of the things that we've got up above the, the ISCs and so forth. So our reps will take a call at 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, you, ha- Saturday night, you Saturday have to, night. mate. You yeah. have to. I, we're in the same. I, we get the same calls. You know, what I mean, our, our clients work twenty four hours a day, seven yeah. days a week, and and you have to, and you ha- you've got to have that personal touch. I think, um, yeah, you, you, you're uh, talking about uh, before about the um, the point of difference sort of thing with us. We also it was about I was probably eight nine years ago. <clears throat> all the major guys put all their uh, manufacturing. Overseas, and so all the um, all the Australian mate, you know, talking, uh, you know, rugby league playing gear or any um, any gear for um, you know, on field, and also school uniforms. So that wasn't being made in Australia. There wasn't anything being made in Australia. So we saw an opportunity there to um, buy <coughs> to buy an embroidery machine, a sublimate, a, and a, a sublimation machine, and a press, and a couple of sewing machines. But on, on me, it was very very sparse, but we could actually make a jersey in about eight hours. I finally got the order on a bit of paper, you know, on a, the old coaster, so you had to redraw it, you had to do all that, to do the artwork, get it to that computer, send it to there, send it to there. At the time it was sewn and ready for the customer, could do it in eight hours. That, uh, over the over the time now, has just grown and grown and grown because these the, the, the opposition still haven't come back to having Australian made products. And, you know, like, and this is because they don't understand they're under sevens. The under seven side gets signed on in, in March, and the club thought they were getting one side. So they, um, um, when they when they put their orders in back in November, there's only one under seven side being made. Yes. Anyway, so at sign on day, they got two sides. Well, they give us a buzz. We have them ready in a week. I need 15 extra jumpers. Rather quickly because yep. we're kicking off next week. They've also got a kid who plays in the centres who's um, Six a foot robust four. little model just turned up and uh, the, the jersey was a bloody, uh, you know, the kids 15, 16, they now need a, a, men, a small men's. Yes. We can make that in a week and get it up to them. And they yeah. Will, that's we that, do, we do, do that that's that personal touch, mate. You're not waiting for it to come from overseas. It, it's personal touch to the people, you know, the grassroots. Not only on that too, Ross, you're, you're able to, to do a one-off jumper where there's not a minimum order. Yeah. Hey, all of a sudden, we, we need that small men's and I need it next week. Yeah. Stop press. We need to run the machines. Can you uh, can you do something for us rather than, oh, no, hang on, you've got to order a minimum of 20? Yeah, but you're talking about the culture of the place now. We um, That is our culture. A, one, a one-off jersey or a one-off pair of shorts, one-off anything, will only lead to bigger orders. That's a great and, approach uh, in, in all businesses. Our, our, um, our top salesman, he's been with me now. I think he, he, he believes he owns the company. I hope he is. <laughs> but, he, but he still does it. <laughs> but he, he's, um, he, he's, a, he's a good mate of mine. I always has been. He's uh, touch footy, you name it, we've done it. He turns over, you know, quite a lot of brass, but... We know him in, in, in our cultural setup as as the one off man because he'd write thirty orders and fifteen of those would be one off, uh, one off repeat, repeat order or the lady up the road needs two of these but she's part of this and you'll find we'll get that later and yeah so he's he's very good at it <laughs> but his sales is the highest in the company and it's because of us looking after our customers and uh, no water's too small. Yeah, that's good. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the podcast, but we have a word from our sponsor. The KRGS Counterline Aluminium Shutter has a slimline 44mm flat flat curtain. Manufactured from aluminium extrusion to provide quality strength with ease of use and attractive appeal. Suitable applications include shopping centres, shop fronts, clubs and hotel bars, countertops, chaos, arcade, surveries, sporting clubs and stadiums, airports and fire reel cupboards. The KRGS counterline shutter can be slotted to provide ventilation when necessary or remain solid to keep out vernum and debris and is available in the standard Dulux powder coat range to suit all decors. For more information, visit www.krgsdoors.com.au or call 1800 897 822. Now back to the podcast. 
Before business, you mentioned you're a rugby league player and a coach and things like that, and you played for the mighty St George Dragons in the early 70s. What were those times like? And then you went along to represent Queensland and also Australia. Well, great days. Can I say that? Just yes, great days. <laughs> um, I, um, I was born in Ningham, um, which is out west of uh, yes. New South Wales. From there, because of work, we, uh, we used to move towns quite a bit. And I uh, went to Trundle and from Trundle down to Sydney. And uh, we moved into the St George area. And uh, I went to Erstville Boys High. Yes. And uh, rep- represented New South Wales in the schoolboys in uh, 62, 63, 64. Uh, I was captain of the side for the last two years of that. And uh, we beat Queensland in every game during that period. And in that in the Queensland side was Johnny Lang, who later on in life I finished up being mates with him and playing with him, um, which was, uh, yeah, that's just one of the things that happens in rugby league. Did you play rugby league at Ningen, mate? Yeah, um, not, my dad did. It yes. It was called Punchy Strudwick. He was a front rower. Okay. Because <laughs> no, our, I... our father and our, our family are from Cobar. Oh, from Cobar? Yeah. Yeah, I've still got... Re- I've still got rallies in Cobar. Yeah, well, so have we. We've still got relatives in um, in Cobar up there, so the Cobar roosters. So, okay. um, and and Dad's obviously uh, he's a couple of years older than you, so it's a, it's your your vintage. But he played uh, he played rugby league up there in Cobar, and then similar to you, moved to moved to Sydney and uh, moved to San Susie, and uh, he went okay. to, he went to James Cook as a as a schoolboy yeah, yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. high yeah. school. We, we used to play them. We used to beat them. Did you? <laughs> We, Drew and I both went to James Cook as well, obviously <laughs> later, later years, but I just wondered if you played footy there at Ningen, but um, yeah, we've still got relatives up there at Cobar, mate. Yeah, no, I was uh, going to um, primary school in Ningen. Um, I think we left there when I was about six or seven. Where did you and move to? Out. Where'd you move to when yeah, you moved yeah, in the St George well, area? You'll know this place, Cambellia. You know Cambellia, which halfway between Ningen and Cobar? Yes. Yeah, um, my um, uncles, including my dad, used to own a uh, sawmill about five uh, five mile Nigan side of uh, Cambellia. Okay, I was only just out there a couple of months ago, and the place is virtually not there anymore. Yeah, I found a stump of our old house, and uh, and that was great. We do all, we do Nigan's jerseys. Yes, we do uh, Trundle jerseys. So we do, you know, we go out and see all these people. That's special for you, mate. That's good. Oh yeah. Uh, Cobar is on the agenda for um, when when this virus gets gets off, which will probably be early next year. Now we got, we'll be heading out to um, Cobar Roosters. As well. What about when you yeah. moved to Sydney, Ross from Ningen? What uh, where'd you move to? You said you're in the St George area. Whereabouts? Yeah, Mortdale. Okay. Yeah. So did you is play local? Only... Did you play local rugby league in Mortdale? Yep, yeah, I was a renowned I was a renowned boy. Okay, Renown United. We both played. We Drew and I both played for uh, had a season at Renown. Edges. Yeah, yes. so I played in yeah, ninety. Smith. I played in ninety seven at uh, Renown. In we got beaten in the grand final in the A grade grand final in ninety seven, and then I went on to coach Drew's side in the C grade under nineteen. Who, uh, who, who beaches? Uh, St John's. No, St oh, John's Lakemba. St John's Lakemba beat us in ninety seven. Uh, bloody Catholics, mate. <laughs> <laughs> But um, you know, it was uh, they're a great club. They've got a great culture, mate. Renown United. Would you believe, um, like we're in New South Wales now. We've opened up in Wollongong. Okay. And, um, yeah, this, this is where you talk about culture, and you know, I was saying that we really haven't. You, if you don't train your people right, yeah, you're not going to get the result that we want from them. But we've been open down there nearly two years now, and would you believe they have not been to Renown to see about their jerseys and whatever. Wow. But that, we're in the we're in the process of changing all that. You'd have to be on that'd be on the agenda. They're very big. In fact, it starts next week. I've got a I've got my most senior guy, but he's young, but he's he's dynamic. We've got such dynamic young bloody people working for us now. It's incredible. But uh, Ross, your time at uh, St George, mate. There, um, you played. You must have played with some of the uh, the greats of the rugby league game. You uh, that alongside of them. <coughs> my first coach. At St George was Johnny Raper, uh, Gaznia and Norm Proven retired the year before, so all the other boys were still still in there. So you had uh, Raper, Smith, Buddy Langlands, shitload of them. And the next coach was Jack Gibson for two years. Yeah, it was what, early 70s. And then, um, that was 70, 71. And then uh, Graham Langlands was uh, 72. 
72 so, catch. Ross, you would have played against a great hero of both Drew and myself. You would have played with uh, the great Harry Eden. Harry Eden. H- Harry Eden played for bloody uh, Ramsgate. He did, Ramsgate United. Um, yeah, good mate of mine. He was uh, <laughs> he was a champion. Mate, but mad Harry. He was a champion bloke, Him and Harry. Jack Gibson finished up very good friends. Yes, uh, H used to work for Jack. Oh, yeah, Harry was the bag man, wasn't he? He was either the bag man or he was the bloody security. Allegedly. <laughs> hey, mate, I'll tell you a story I heard. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. You know, just talking on those coach, Raper, Raper taught me a lot about uh, training, your peak fitness and what you've got to be at and so forth. Jack Gibson taught me about me. He, uh, Vince Lombardi used to quote him quite a lot yes. on, uh, on time, personal time and all that sort of stuff. And then Langlands just taught me about be who you are on a football field. Who was the best that you yeah. played alongside of, Ross? Be Wally Lewis. The king. He, uh, he uh, just unbelievable. We were, one of my um, greatest experiences in, in my early part was when I, the first year I was up in Queensland, which was 73, and I played for Queensland that year. We played, well, of course we played New South Wales. Billy Smith was the um, halfback. And uh, like I'd already pl- played with him. Um, I had him at 5'8 at one stage. One t- uh, at one stage, I was 5'8, he was halfback. And I always admired him and on and off the field. And anyway, I got the opportunity to play against him. And I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm bloody 23 and he's got to be 29. I'm going to kick his ass. <laughs> Mate, I've never copped a flogger in my life. <laughs> copped in that game. He, he, he was just magic, just absolutely magic, but tough. Yeah, tough been magic. They don't make them like that like anymore, right, unfortunately? Well, if, every time they do these bloody things on, on social media about who's the best halfback and all that sort of stuff, I always jump in there and say, hang on, what about bloody Billy Smith, you know? He, he's, he toured bloody uh, Australia, as, uh, New England, yeah, uh, in the old days when the Poms were beating us bloody oh, six years in a row or something, and he went over there and bloody uh, got split open, cut, and all the rest of it. But what he did for the rest of the side, we actually won the series over there. It was the first time for a long time, and he doesn't even get a bloody mention. mention. And and I think it, 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 he was a bad boy off the field. You know, he used to like to drink a lot of piss and cause a bit of trouble <laughs> and, and whatever, but... You, you can't take that away from, from who he was as a player. And I think they, they are doing that to him. Yeah. Um, you know, it, like it, I don't think he's even in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, he should and, be, mate. He's one of, he's one of our favourites, oh, obviously. Mate, like, you know, they, they talk about buddy, um, that guy on telly, whatever his name is, the, the two brothers. Johns, Andrew Johns? Yeah, the Johns boys. And they talk about the halfback, greatest halfback ever. they got to be fucking kidding. <laughs> Yeah, I just can't believe it. But that's the way rugby league's gone. It's gone with a whole heap of people who don't know too much. Yeah. Any coaches. When you played yeah. for Australia, Ross, it was 75, correct? 75, yeah. And Chang Langlands was the coach then? He was the coach, yep. Yeah. I had a couple of beers. This is how things had changed. The night, the night before the game, him and I had a couple of beers in the bar. <laughs> That was preparation, just to mate. Settle, just to settle the nerves. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Now it's unbelievable. Fr- now it's frowned upon, mate. Oh, we can't do it. Imagine, imagine the press getting hold of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, or some social media, someone with a with a phone like this one of mine, you can almost do anything on. Yeah, like we we won the comp up there in seventy three, seventy four. Won a car, won the competition, played for Queensland. I mean, what a great year! The complete package, mate. Yeah, it is. It is. And seventy four, um, we won the comp again. And played for Queensland, 75, played for Queensland, Australia. So, you know, go, going up there was, wasn't a bad thing to do. Obviously. Um, back back at uh, St George, I was negotiating nearly all of uh, 72. The the league had bought in a um, ruling that $2,000 sign-on and $200 a game was max payments. Yes. Maximum payments you could get. And, um, like, I, I was out of, me, out of my apprenticeship and working as a marine engineer, and I, I could de- earn more money than that doing overtime. Well, Frankie couldn't listen to any of that sort of stuff. And, and me being 22, you know, you didn't have agents work talking for you in them days. You had to do it yourself. So as a 22-year-old, that, that was pretty a daunting time in my life. When you say Frank, mate, that was Frank Facer, the Secretary of St George? Yeah, Frank Frank Facer, yeah. 
Did you get any offers from any other Sydney clubs apart from St George, mate, or what attracted you to Saints? Yes, Was it I actually actually had uh, negotiations with three or four. Uh, Canterbury offered me a contract which was way above the 2,200. Uh, old Bullfrog, he was under the same laws as what Facer was, but it didn't worry him. Yeah. So he was going to be under the carpet and everything else like that, um, <laughs> which I think they got picked up on that about, what, 20 years later, didn't they? Yeah, <laughs> obviously, mate, yes, they did. So th- their culture didn't change. No. Uh, but but they were winning comps in those days. That's what mattered. Yeah. So, buddy, uh, I was having this trouble, and I had a check. I had a chat to uh, Langlands and Smith about it because they're, um, you know, they're playing for Australia and all that, and they knew Queensland pretty well. And I said, you know, what what am I going to do? Because I, I, I just can't bloody, uh, can't accept, t- you know, 200. And, and I was St. George, you know, I come through, played President's Cup, Jersey flag, SG ball. Yeah. Played all that. Yeah, so there was no way in the world that I was leaving St. George. But they said, well, go in and have a talk to this Jim Comins, solicitor in town. Yeah. He finished up uh Finished up doing something for rugby league after that, so I went and spoke to him, and you know he knew who I was and so forth. And he's and after a while he says, um, "All right, well you got Canberra and you got this and you got that. Um, what about Queensland?" And I thought, "Well, shit, I haven't, I, you know, never thought about it. Twenty two years of age, geez. Anyway, uh, he says, "Well, you know, what do you want to go up there?" And I said, "Oh, don't know, <laughs> don't know. It'd have to be pretty good." Anyway, he got McCall up on the phone there in front of me and they had a chat. It would have chatted for a quarter of an hour. He come back and he says, all right, how does eight grand tax-free, a bloody uh, car and a uh, place to live in and uh, you can uh, sign with whichever club up there you want to. And you said, where do I and sign? I <laughs> did. I fucking signed on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Before they changed their mind. <laughs> Give me your pen. And I got... I left there and I got home with my parents and I said, I'm going to Queensland. <laughs> what do you mean you're going to Queensland? I had a girlfriend and I had to tell her, when I went and saw St George, they um, put on a bit of a uh, bit of a do. They was having a bit of a do and and uh, I've gone into the do and told them that I was leaving. So naturally I was sort of turfed out. But they come back and wanted to renegotiate with me. It wasn't Queensland, but it was it was pretty good. If they had have done that prior, I wouldn't have been talking to anyone. Anyway, I, I thought about it, and about four or five days later, I, I just said, hey, self, Queensland didn't bug your eyes around. They give you what they thought you were worth. worth. Why, why, would you, why would you get out of that contract with someone who you've been speaking to now, you know, six months, uh, you've been loyal, you've been come through the juniors, you've done everything bloody right. Why would you not honour that contract? And and that's probably where I get this honesty thing. You know, you've got to be honest. You've got to be loyal. You know, you've got to understand what's right and what's not right. So I finished up in Queensland. Sounds good, mate. Good work. Away from work, how do you relax? Mate, I, I don't know if I do relax. I, I think I re- relax all day, every day at work because I absolutely love it. Football was exactly the same. The only times I couldn't relax in football was after a loss because I used to toss and turn for about two or three nights thinking about it. Uh, but I do love uh, I love fishing, but I don't do enough of it. I used to do scuba diving, water skiing, and all that sort of stuff whenever I could get get there. And now I go um, snow skiing. How's the old knees take to that, mate? Uh, knees are pretty good. Energy energy is the biggest problem for present. <laughs> Jeez, there's some steep hills over there. Because <laughs> we 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 head over to uh, Zermatt and. Uh, Val Terrans in France. We get, we get over there every uh, couple of years now. To finish up our podcast, we ask all our guests our fast five questions. So they're just a rapid fire just to get to know you a little bit better. What would be your last meal? Lamb shank and potato. Oh, that sounds nice. That does sound nice, especially in cold weather. Oh, I cook by the missus too, mate, and she can cook. What's your drink of choice? Uh, Heineken. Heineken or Chardonnay. It's on what I'm doing. <laughs> Your favourite holiday destination? Zermatt or UK. Haven't had that before. No, that is a, uh, that's an unusual one. Uh, if a movie yep. was made about your life, who would play you? Honest, liar, um, and good bloke. <laughs> Someone that fits those realms. And if finally, if heaven does exist, what would God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? It, I, I think he'd say, um, you're an honest bloke, Rossi. Um, you've probably hurt some, but not love you. 
Um, you've also helped in your life lots and lots of people. So I think you can have a little stay here. <laughs> So, um, thanks very much, Ross. It's been great to talk, and and mate, I'm, I'm, there's enough. I'm sure there's more stories there that we'd love to go and and touch on. So, we might get you on again um, down the track, and we can obviously uh, expand on some of those stories and and uh, that you've had throughout, obviously playing in your playing career. It's been great, mate. Yeah, we didn't get to, we didn't get to talk about Wally Lewis, mate. No, we didn't get to talk about the King. I've well, got to thank uh, one of your gun sales guys, Gary Sonder, for uh, getting us in touch with you and being able to organise the um, the have a chat. It's been it's been great, and um, thanks very much for telling us the Ross Strudwick story as well as the um, Struddy Sports Retail. If any uh, clubs or sporting clubs or schools are are interested uh, talking to you guys, they can obviously find you on the website. And um, you can uh, supply their apparel, but it's not only rugby league clubs; it's sporting clubs. Um, obviously, touch football, uh, netball, everything that y- y- you guys can do. So, um, if anyone's out there and listening that wants to uh, get involved and, and talk to Strudies, they I can tell you they do do a, a a fantastic product because the sports that we're involved with, we use Strudies gear, and it's good quality, and they've got good people. Yeah, yeah I was just thinking about Gary Sonder. Uh, that's another direction change that we've had we've we've um we've always had sales reps that cover all sports and schools or all sales michael this genius i got bloody run the place which is 27 year old um and he is he is a genius um he he, uh knew gary really well uh through touch and um he said you know why aren't we diversifying just into touch get a, a touch rep yes and uh so we put Gary on, and that's the first time we've done that. Now we have a touch rep. We have a uh, Pacific uh, Rugby League rep. Um, we've got, we, we're have got we about to uh, employ a uh, netball rep. Yeah, and, good on uh, you. And we're going to approach sales that way. Yeah, that's a good idea, mate. Someone, someone that's got their ear to the ground has obviously got some sort of um, – well, Gary's obviously well known throughout uh, touch circles. He's been involved with, with the game, and he's been at the, at the highest of highs – uh, in the game, so it's good to have involved. Uh, he, he knows the people, and he knows the industry, and he knows the culture. The Michael Rasmussen is the uh, is is the guy I'm talking about. Yeah, he said to me when he was uh, trying you know, trying to convince me that we should have a touch rep on. He says he is to uh, touch football that you are to Queensland Rugby League. You're pretty true. And I thought. Well, we've got to put this bloke on, don't He's we? Pretty true, mate. You're spot on. Uh, Ross, been good. thank you very much for your time, mate. We do appreciate it. Uh, you can go back to um, looking after your pet dog there that we saw earlier on. He's uh, big, yeah, he's, oh, oh, he's doing it tough. Look it's at that. a tough life hey? playing there. He's a tough gig, that. Thanks, Look after Oscar. yourself and we'll chat soon. Take care, mate. Uh, that wraps up our chat with Ross Strudwick from Struddy's Sportswear. If you need any apparel, visit www.struddies.com.au. If you have missed any previous episodes of the KRGS Doors podcast, you can download them from our website, www.krgsdoors.com.au forward slash podcast, or on your favourite podcast player, search KRGS Doors. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to ensure you don't miss any future episodes. This also boosts our ranking and my ego. The other thing I suggest, if you have enjoyed the podcast, head to your favourite podcast player and leave a review or a rating. On our next episode, we speak to Wade Orger, the voice of Speedway in Australia. Wade has that much dirt and methanol fuel in his nostrils, he can't breathe properly. In fact, he has also just released his own drink called Methanol Moonshine. I've been your host, Drew Blackman, and you've been fantastic for tuning in today. As always, you could be anywhere in the world, but you're here with us. Thanks. Till next time. The KRGS Doors Show, proudly brought to you by KRGS Doors. For all your shopfront roller shutters, roller grills, folding closures and bifold doors, visit www.krgsdoors.com.au.